I was hoping they'd do some special music on their way up. I knew they were going to be here. I know they're musical, and I thought, boy, I hope they sing something or play something. They also do a lot of instruments. Hey, how'd you like that supper tonight? Uh, when I pastored New York, I had three men get saved that I called my Italian mafia. Across, all around the parishes in the church, we had ballerino, sicarella, fraterino. I mean, it was just everybody was. But these three guys got saved, Rick Bazzoni, Frank Carella, and Vic Vigillo. And they all came out of New York City and kind of walked like this, and hey, you know? One of them would walk into church on Sunday, and you know how well shake hands or whatever. He'd walk up and just pat my face and go, who loves you, baby? <laughs> And I, I'm a main boy, and I'm like, what's he mean? <laughs> yeah. So I had another one, the big guy. He was a United States Marshal undercover in New York. And he got saved. And I, mean, I had to learn a whole new lingo. Jay, it wasn't jail, it was slammer. But anyway, we had a big church supper. And I said, hey, Rick, what would you think of that supper? And his comment was, I ate like I was going to your electric chair. <laughs> <laughs> They were a real joy to us. Thank the Lord for the times that we had there with people in Highland Falls, New York. It's just outside of West Point. We're on the Hudson River. Turn your Bibles to Joshua chapter 7. We've been in chapter 6, the last two messages. Now we get to chapter 7. I've appreciated your attention. You folks have listened so well. There are some churches, a few of them, that I'll go into. I was in one where I had not been there for years and years and years. And they'd gone through a lot of struggles in the church. And man, when I got up, you could feel like on this side, the icicles. You know, and it was like, everybody was like, oh. And it was right after the tragedy here. And I said, I want to know, how many of you saw in the newspapers or saw in the news about, and I mentioned what happened? I said, that was my niece. All the ice melted. All of a sudden, people were listening. But there was a lot of bitterness there, a lot of hatred. That's sad when you go into that. I go into some other churches, like the one in New Hampshire, it's like feeding robins, you know? It's just, they're sitting there with their mouths open waiting. Joshua chapter 7 starts out with a word that, boy, does it change things. But, great blessings. God had given them Jericho. He told them in chapter 6, I've given you Jericho, and you do what I tell you to do. And he talked about all of the importance of that, to do exactly what God orders us to do. And the walls fell down. I mean, and when you go over to Israel and you look down and you see some of the excavation there, what they've done, it's just like, Wow. But, that's right, but, watch out when you've had big blessings, victories. God has blessed, God has worked, God has done great things in your life or in your church or whatever. Look out. The roaring lion goes around seeking whom he may devour. He goes around seeking who he may devour. It says here, but the children of Israel. You said, no, 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 it was Achan. Well, Achan was part of Israel. Some Bible scholars wonder if others in Israel knew that they had, he had stolen, so they were kind of part of it. I don't know. But they had other problems, as we see with Ai. So here, right after a great victory, the children of Israel had some problems. But the children of Israel committed trespass in the accursed thing. What was that? God said there are certain things you don't touch. There is the silver, there is the gold, and there's the Babylonian garments. So I looked it up. The Babylonian mantle uh, were oftentimes made uh, of fur. They would be very expensive in those days. The silver that was taken, about $360, according to now. And the gold, well, some have said $3,200. It was quite a bit of stuff. And the walls fell down, and they went in. And they were supposed to keep everything, as the Bible says here, for the Lord. This time, it was going to be the Lord's. But Achan saw, let's go on. 
The Bible says, and the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel, last part of verse 1, two, verse 2, and Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai. Now, he didn't know what had happened. They went to Ai, which is beside beth Aven, on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai, and they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let two hundred or three, excuse me, two or three thousand go up and smite Ai. Make not all the people to labor thither, thither, for they are but few. Who's but few? Ai. They estimate twelve hundred. I said, don't send out. Everybody's tired walking around Jericho. And then we've been cleaning up there all that God told us to do. Uh, we went up, we looked at it. It's small. It's no problem. We don't hear anywhere where they look to the Lord about it. Are we supposed to do this, Lord? Now, back in chapter 5, we see where Joshua was before the Lord. And he got his orders. And he gave the orders to the people. And God brought great victory. But... Yeah, but Achan went in. Oh, we see here the, in verse 21, he gives his testimony. This is a testimony that has come down through the ages. You pastors that are here perhaps have heard it. I've heard it. When you bring somebody into the office or somebody comes to see you and they have done something before God which was wrong, perhaps stolen or, or whatever it might be, and they say this, I saw... I coveted, I took. That's been the pattern down through the years. Every man that looks at pornography, there it is. People who steal, there it is. People who've stolen or people who have, you know, we had a student in our academy years ago that we didn't know it, but just off of the classroom, the big classroom, there was an office there for the principal and the secretary, and they were both busy in the classroom, and parents had come and given money for tuition and whatever, and so the secretary put it in the door. And that night when she counted out, she was $100 short. We thought, where did that go? Well, the school was out 100 bucks. We made it. We didn't have to close. Everything was fine. But years later... I got a letter from a student in Bible college, married student now. He said, I've been under such conviction for these years. You know that $100 that you had stolen out of the office? I did it. I did it. And God has convicted me. I took that which was wrong. It was actually to be used for the school, but I stole. That was wrong. And God has broken my heart over this. And here he was in Bible college, and he sent more than 100. He says, here's why I stole plus interest. This is God's. It wasn't mine. Wow. I mean, who cares about the money? I was thankful for the victory. He, really, what he could say, I saw, I coveted, I took. It's happened a lot. It happens in churches almost every Sunday. Let's go on in you know, chapter 16 and verse, or 6 and verse 19, rather. What does it say there? But all the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. He's when you go in, when you see all of that, that belongs to the treasury of the Lord. Now, I'm going to do something that nowadays people can get fussing about. Oh, you. It's so all we hear is you Baptist preachers talking about giving. Now, I'm talking about giving, I'm talking about stealing. <laughs> one old preacher said some, one of the biggest robberies every Sunday is in the local Baptist church. The Lord, that which belongs to the Lord. I mean, the Bible says we are to give at least a, time, a tenth, plus all that God has blessed us with. They had been blessed. They didn't have to fight that wall. They didn't have to tear it down. God brought it down. He went in, he took Friend, we look at all of this, and here's the first point. Spiritual defeat comes because we rob God. Think about that. You say, well, boy, this has been a hard week. I really can't afford to give to God the tenth that is his. It's not mine, it's his. He'll understand it's been a rough week. 
I remember we talked about them going around the wall. You do everything exactly as God had said. I had a guy come to my church in New York, and he was an Italian. <laughs> he was one of the few. But, and I love these Italian people. Boy, I'll tell you, they're food. Anyway, we were up single on the parsonage roof. He says, Pastor, I want to tell you something. I just can't get over something. I was going to another church, and we moved here. We started coming to this church, and he said, we've been growing. But he said, we were struggling with tithing. Just didn't feel we could afford it. Until one day, he said, just reading God's word, it said, will a man rob God, bring you all the tithes to the storehouse? And he said, I want to tell you something. She and I started tithing immediately. I can't believe how much money he had left over. Before that, it was skinching every week. But we gave God his, and it was like he blessed. Listen to this one. We had a missionary we supported in Australia. And they, the church was growing, and they needed a building, and it was a building nearby that was just perfect for the church. It was well over $100,000 for the building, and that's quite a long time ago. Pastor thought, well, and he told the people, we'll just have to seek the Lord on this, what, you know, to do. A few weeks went by, and a couple that had been coming to their church for a while came to him and said, boy, has God been dealing with my heart. As I get into the Bible, and as I study the Bible, I realize something. My wife and I have been robbing from God for a long time. We didn't know about this. Boy, what the missionary didn't know is this man was very wealthy. He said, we're going to work on this and pray on this because we've got to do some figuring. The years and the... You know what I'm going to say. Treasurer went to check the offering the next week or so and then American money, over $100,000. Because the guy was a millionaire. He says, near as we could tell, we'd give a little up in the offering, but he said, we weren't doing what God told us to do. Now here... Achan and the children of Israel were part, he's part of them. He wasn't doing what God told him to do. Don't touch that, that's mine. You say, boy, is God selfish? No, God has plans for everything, every purpose under the sun. It was not his to take, it was not his to give. What about Ananias and Sapphira? Acts, you know, we read about it there. Uh, to take God's money means Defeat. See it right here. But, and you know, they sent some men to go and look at AI. About 12 miles away, they went and looked at it, and after 13 times going around Jericho, AI looked real small. <laughs> they said, don't send all of the people. Just send a few thousand. Piece of cake. We can take this, no problem. See the pride? See the fact that they were taking the glory for what God had done with that big city. Don't rob God of his glory. When God blesses, say, praise the Lord. Oh, this is wonderful. This is wonderful. When God blesses, you say, oh, I can't keep all this for myself. This is his. Look what he's done. Look what he's, yeah. So we see the spiritual defeat comes because we rob God. Secondly, spiritual defeat comes because we do not prepare for the little battles. Now, there are two things going. You ever watch some old show or something, and there are two kind of stories going at once in the same thing? Here's Achan. He stole. But here are the children of Israel. They go up and look at Ai. Oh, we can take that. And they came back defeated. Didn't win. We look at this and we say, wow. So we see defeat as far as with Achan because eventually he died for what he did. A spiritual defeat comes because we do not prepare for the little battles. When God has blessed us through a big battle, I'll be fessed up to it. It's very easy to say, oh, we can handle this one. Or oh, the church can handle this one. Lord, we'll give you a break. You see, I would never say that. We do it. The little ones. I had a lady in my church in Massachusetts. What a prayer warrior. Oh, she was just such a blessing. And one, I used to carry my little, my little pocket calendar in my suit coat pocket. And I had listed there all the guest speakers coming, the missionaries and all of us, and I lost it. And 
couldn't find it. I mean, I, the secretary and I were in big trouble here because I never should have kept it just in that. And so I announced, folks, please pray. I lost my calendar thing. You know, it's, she comes up to me and she said, what color was it? I said, it was orange. Oh, I've been praying for a red one. And she was that exact in her prayers. I'm going to start praying for a red one. The next Sunday, I went to reach for the glass of water under here. My hand felt something. Then I remembered that Sunday I had taken it out and thrown it under, the, under here because she prayed for the right color. <laughs> you say, that is stupid. That's how serious she was about praying. She prayed specifically for the little things as well as the big. Now, this is where they went wrong. They had, Joshua had sought God about Jericho. Nothing was said about them seeking the Lord about Ai. It was like, we can do this. This is easy, no problem. Yes, everything before the Lord is, is important, big or small. He said, I don't want to bother the Lord in my prayer about this little thing here or this little problem there. I don't want to bother him about that. He wants you to ask. He wants you to seek his face. And we rob God of the glory due him by saying, I'm not going to bother him with this. I never forgot that little notebook, but I, I stopped carrying it in my pocket. Now I have a, like this, with everything in it. Oh, listen. Secondly, spiritual defeat comes because we are not prepared for the big battles. Verse 3 through verse 5 of this passage. No job is too little for the Lord. We, we get worried. Well, this job is too big for him. Well, the Lord took care of the church in Australia. There was the funds to buy it. But the small things, the small things, what is it you haven't prayed for? You know, maybe something has come up. Oh, no, that's just such a small thing. That's not important. And here was a battle. It was a battle, but they didn't have to fight it, walking around Jericho. Now they're going to have to fight this one, but they never sought the Lord. And in the meantime, one of their men and his family had stolen what God said, don't steal, that belongs to me. Whoa. Third, spiritual defeat comes because we do not follow the will of God. Now, to go along with what I talked about this morning, specifically, Exactly, expectantly, remember those things we talked about? I'm not this business of something good's going to happen to you, not that business. I'm saying expectantly that God is going to work, he's going to do what he wants to do, I'm going to trust him. And the whole theme as he walked around the walls, and now, supposedly for AI, is by faith. Ooh, our whole Christian life's that way, we're saved by faith, walk by faith and not by sight, faith. It comes, we, not, we do not follow. They did not seek the Lord for advice. We, we do not see anything here about Joshua and the people getting before the Lord. What about AI, Lord? Huh, we can take this one, no problem. Look out. I played for Glen Cove Christian Academy. It used to be down here in the Rockland area. We loved basketball. And we had a good team my, my sophomore year, junior year, whichever it was. And we, were, we played, all the public schools were in no other Christian schools to play, and we played public schools. And we made the state tournament. We played in the Lewiston Armory. It's only about two miles from my house right now. I thought, we thought we were in Boston Gardens. You know, you ever been there? It's got a balcony that goes around all like this. I mean, the floor was wonderful. And it had real glass backboards. In those days, we didn't have many of those. Well, we played the first round, and we beat a team we shouldn't have beaten. I mean, it was just, it was on radio. I mean, they had men there from Rockland, WRKD, covering the game, you know, and everybody was amazed that we beat that team. And so the coach made a mistake. The next day, he brought us over to the, to the gym or the big arena, and they had us step in the balcony and watch number one play number eight. That's the way you do it. One, eight, two, five, you know, seven, all the And I mean, number one played a terrible game. They won. But a terrible game. We're sitting in the balcony. Piece of cake. Oh, man. We're going to be playing them next. Whoa. Because we beat number two team. And we were number seven. It's going to be easy. My mother said, watch out. You guys, because she was the dorm mother. You're coming in with too much pride. That first win, great. 
We went there and played them. Our star guard, who was in the state championship for foul shooting, he was a tremendous foul shooter. Folks, he was 8 for 21 from the foul line because he was fouled a lot, always the way. We lost. We walked out there like this. The mother said, I told you. <laughs> All of a sudden, the, the, the team was called Strong, Strong High School. They're now it's with some other teams, but uh, schools, but Strong High School. And we thought, they're not very strong. But the way we played in the last game, watch out, folks. Watch out. It can happen to us. The defeat comes because we do not follow the Lord. He warns us about pride. He warns us about getting carried away with self. Number four, spiritual defeat comes because we take the glory ourselves. Verse three, and they returned to Joshua and said unto him, let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand go up and smite them. Now hold it. Back in the previous chapter, God had said, you go around the walls of Jericho, I have given it to you. He was already saying, here's victory. He had never promised victory. They'd never asked him about victory. And here are these guys saying, we got it. We got it. Here it is. Spiritual defeat comes because we take the glory for ourselves. They became cocky. They became arrogant. I and mean, it's just like, AI is easy. No problem. We must be careful when preaching, teaching, singing, whatever it might be. Don't give, don't keep the glory. Some of you know my cousin Sharon. Uh, we grew up through high school together, but as we were little kids and growing up through, we sang together. My mother worked with us. We sang at weddings. We sang at conferences. We sang. It, you know, she had the real frilly dress, and I had the bow tie, and the, and we would get up and sing. And our mother played for us, but she gave us a message every time. Now you get up there, the only reason you can sing is because God gave you the voice. Don't you even think you're good. Don't let them afterwards pat you on the head and say, oh, you kids are so sweet, because we know you're not. <laughs> you know my mother. Yeah. We're, we like to take it for ourselves. Boy, I preached a great message today. And that solo, I said, oh, boy. Oh, and the piano playing, I was just so good. I mean, go on and on and on and on. We must be careful. We can't take the glory that's the Lord's. You see, one man put it this way. More people stumble because they can't take success than those who can't take failure. There are those who can't take failure, but many stumble because they can't take success. It's like immediately... Oh, oh. Mm. My mother directed the choral group for our academy, and they won Massachusetts three years in a row. And so we got to go to the national competition of the American Association of Christian Schools in Greenville, South Carolina. 2,000 kids from around the nation there, preaching, singing, art, whatever. And my, my, my wife could tell that the kids thought they were pretty good. You know what they call the small pawn syndrome? Until you heard the first choral group. Oh! And then the next one. We never placed in the top three. I think we got four at one time. But it was good for them. That's good for them. Because that small pawn syndrome. In Massachusetts, we were good, I guess. But then we got down there. Oh, forget it. Be careful. Be careful when God blesses. Be careful when God supplies a need. Be careful when God works. Number five, spiritual defeat comes because all sin. Chapter 7, look at verse 11. Israel hath sinned. Oh, no, 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 you say it was Achan. Well, the attitude was with the whole country because AI, we got it. Theirs was pride, and here's Achan. He's looking, oh boy. I look, I saw, I took it. And he was honest about it and told him exactly what happened. Now, there's one sinner named here, Achan. And of course, his family must have been part of it because they were also stoned to death. But it was other sin of the camp. Don't forget, pastors, don't forget, Christian workers, 
You may look at your church, and I mean, I'm in some church where I speak. I just love to go there. They're just such dear people. But they're sinners. They're all capable. They all have the old Adamic nature. They're saved. They're new believers in Christ, but they are capable. And then you'll hear if somebody fell into this or that. How could they do that? Pride, not trusting the Lord, and just exactly what Achan said. We can't take the glory for credit. Why? Because all have sinned. Paul said, greatest missionary to ever lived. Do you know what he said? Oh, wretched man that I am. And he was a great missionary. You just have to realize it's all the Lord, none of me. He just uses me as a vessel, but it's all the Lord. Has anybody remembered years ago Coach Lee Rock Royer? Okay, he was the defensive coach of the Navy football team. He also coached for the New Orleans Saints, and he got saved. And after he got saved, he traveled and preached. And I mean, it was like Billy Sunday in your church. I mean, he took his tie off and left it here. He's down this aisle. He's over here. It wasn't for show. He just really was into his preaching because he didn't have long to wait. And the night he came and arrived on a Saturday night at our place, my mother, my, mother, my wife had a nice bedroom all for him. Everything set, you know. And uh, towels and all of this. He said, no. He said, I just shouldn't sleep on the couch. She said, why? This is, yeah, but he said, listen, I, I, I've, been, I've been there with a lot of things and a lot of money and a lot of success. I've been a coach. Now I'm a preacher for the Lord. I just don't want to think, boy, I'm really something as you're doing all this for me. Give me the couch. And that Sunday, God worked in such a way in our church. My people got right with the Lord. Uh, Service started at quarter of 11, finished at one something. He didn't preach that long. It's just people were down at the aisle, down at the altar. Just God began to work. But I knew as a pastor, watch out. Yes, we all have to be careful. Others sin too. Pastors, science school teachers, parents, friends. Somewhere down the line, somebody else will let you down. That's why you must realize that anything good that comes out of us is him. It's not us. It's not us. Number six. The leader shared the blame. Look at verse six. The leader did. And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the Lord, the ark of the Lord. Oh, by the way, uh, where was the ark when they went to Ai to fight it? They went around Jericho with the people. It was the symbol of the presence of the Lord. Where was the ark? Well, it was kind of heavy to carry the guys. I'm just making this up. We'll just leave it back this time. They lost. And now, here's Joshua realizing, oh, we've got sin in the camp with this. We've got sin because our own, and he fell down on his face before the Lord. All that he started there. Lord, thank you for the victory at Jericho. Now we got Ai. Will you help us with this? Yes, he realized that he was part of it too. They all were. We should be careful about putting the blame on others. They used to tell us in school that when you go like this, you've got a thumb and three fingers aiming back at you. So don't just say, it's them. It's them. Hold it. We used to sing the old quartet number, not the preacher, not the deacon, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Oh, we see here the problem ahead. And then Joshua responded to defeat. Verse 6, verse 7, he came to the place of the blood, the altar. He came to the place of the house of God, or it was represented the house of God. He came to the altar. He rent his clothes. It's just a sign of the sorrow. What have I done? Say, what have I done? What have we done? Outward display of grief. And he led in the punishment. Boy, I mean, he might have known. Boy, you know, old Aiken, he's a good old boy. And his, his family, sweet kids and whatever, they touched what they weren't supposed to. They took, and they've suffered. We've suffered. I hate to do this. But they stoned him, his family. 
And those things that he had to have, boy, you're thinking, boy, if I had this, and I had that, and I had this, and I had that, he died with nothing. How sad. I say this to closing. No matter what it is in your life, if, if, if you come here and you've got a Jericho you're facing, or there's some sin you know you haven't dealt with, and, and you've been putting it off, or you're embarrassed about it, or and, and you know something's got to be done. I heard a tremendous illustration. I had a pastor's conference at our church. There was a pastor from down here in, in uh, just down below Portland. And he gave this illustration, which I never forgot. He said, back one of the windows on the right-hand side of the auditorium, he would walk down there, and here was a cobweb. He didn't want a cobweb in his church, so he wiped it all out. He'd go back a few days later, another cobweb. And then one of the dear ladies in church made a suggestion. Kill the spider. Oh, we're busy wiping out cobwebs, and the Lord says, but there's this spider right here. And you know what it is. You don't have to confess it to me or to anybody else. You know what it is. And when Achan was faced with it, he said, yeah, I did it. This is how it happened. I'm wrong. Boy. But you know, they got that straightened out. The children of Israel sought God's face. He went back, and Ai was theirs. Interesting. He also let them keep the spoil. Ah, but the first one, that was his. Our wonderful Lord gives victory. Our wonderful Lord gives us the privilege of giving back to him a portion he's blessed us with. I think of this place up here, and it's very dear to me. And when I was in Palmer, we had a men's remission team. Uh, Corey was on it. And we did several things through the years, but one of them was this. Is our men came up, and don't pat us in the back. That's not it. They shingled that roof down there on the, where some of you were sleeping tonight. Corey put all new electrical in it. You know how we were able to do it? A grandparents who had a kid in our Christian school that graduated, they weren't from our church, they were from Connecticut, but their, pet, their, kid, their, their children didn't realize that they were millionaire. Two daughters and a son. They didn't know, because they lived very frugal. And in their will, they said this, we want you to tithe the money that we're giving you, and we want it given to Faith Baptist Christian Academy. $100,000. I almost faked it. And the two women are crying. We didn't know that they had this, but they're insistent that God's given his part. But we said we can't keep this all for ourselves. We did get a van for the kids to have a better van to ride in. But then we bought some cars, some missionaries, and put that the shingles in that building. We said, let's do it. God gave it. Let's just. Yeah. Don't pat me on the back. This was just the right way to look at it. And God continued to bless us. But what I'm saying, that, oh, what a joy it was to, to do this. And to help missionaries. And to say, listen, we'll, we'll, here, we'll get this car for you. Let's get this fixed down here. And then Bob Philbrick's church here, they got on the bandwagon, and they built that deck around that building. The men came up, built it, put it in there. That's how a lot of this has happened. These people just have said, you know what? We want to bless God. He's blessed us so much here. And Mitch goes, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's so much fun to go, man, but it's not fun to say, I stole it. We did wrong. We thought AI was a piece of cake. We'll finish this tomorrow morning. Thank you for listening so well. But let me say this. If God is dealing with you on an area, it's very easy right now where you're tender to say, boy, I've got to deal with that. And then you go out, you go see the fireworks, and you sit around the fire, and you take a few minutes to go get along with the Lord someplace. There are a lot of rooms and space here. Say, Lord, I'm tired of carrying this thing. This, this, my Jericho is just too much, Lord. It's you. It can't be me. 
And if it involves somebody else, go to them and say, listen, I need to say that God is working in my heart, and I'm sorry for my part in what I've done. You begin to feel like, freedom. God is so gracious to forgive. He's also gracious to point it out, but we go, no, no, no. no. Some big lessons here. Let's pray. Lord, deal with our hearts. Deal with my heart. I thank you for these dear people, how well they've listened tonight in this humid weather. But Lord, we thank you that your word is true. We thank you for what we can learn from the children of Israel and even Achan and even Joshua. Because we see ourselves in that mirror. May we not rob you. May we give you what belongs to you. Lord, might we not look selfishly but say, how can I be a blessing? So it may be missionaries or missionary or this or that. What can I do? God, you continue to bless and help them, Lord. Help us. Give us a good evening, a good night's rest. And then bless us. We look at the final message tomorrow. In Jesus' name, amen. I just thought of something. When I was in college, we had a guy that went to our church. He had a big, massive penthouse, you know, like hundreds of thousands of them. And then he'd buy a piece of land and then just doubled his price or whatever. It just, I mean, lost. And, and he said, boy, he said, Paul, he said, been busted. I bought cars from mission. Church didn't know about it. Bought cars from missionaries. He said, I got a big frustration in my Christian life. I can't outgive God. He give, I give, he gives me more. I give, we don't give for that. He said, boy, Christian life, you just can't outgive God. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Thank the Lord for that message. I was thinking he was talking about the men from Palmer, the men for missions from Palmer that came to work on our retreat center. And I was thinking how Corey made me. Do you remember this, Corey? Corey, we'll get a rip all the wires out from under the building down there. It was like a rat's nest. Underneath the building, all these old wires hanging down from like every room and running or back and forth under there. And he said, we've got to rip all those wires out. And so I want you, how can a young man tell? Just, I want you I can't remember who, somebody, who was it helping me? I want you to get under there and rake all the old insulation that's fallen down and all the trash and all the stuff that was thrown under there. Rake all that out. <laughs> I just remember being under that building. On the far end, you, you, like, you, you can't even really fit on the front end where the door is. It's so low to the ground. And breaking in all this dust and dirt and coughing and choking. That's what I thought about when you... <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, um, praise God. Praise God. The Lord's blessed. That work was done about 15 years ago. You think, oh, this little job only takes a weekend. It's not that important. Not that important. When Clinton came and built our big, beautiful deck down there, you know, big, beautiful deck is still there. That was about probably 14 years ago, the year after we got started there. But maybe it was the fifth. It was right when we get getting started doing this. And to think that still there, 
is still there. You think, oh, this is just a little job. It's not worth the time. We just put a swing set out here. The last swing set was just, I mean, it's just a little swing set, that, but it's been there for 19 years. I found it beside the road before we moved up here. Uh, when I was delivering newspapers, that swing set was beside the road and went and took it apart and put it back together and you think, doesn't amount to anything. 19 years, kids swinging back and forth. And the work of the Lord is marvelous. The work of the Lord is glorious and honorable. It is nothing like the work of the Lord. And the world says, God isn't even at work. God's not even at work. God's doing nothing. Where is God? Well, all through the Bible, the work of the Lord is glorious, is honorable, is marvelous, and we get, we, God uses us. It's amazing. It, it is amazing. Um, praise the Lord for that, for that message.